We're joined by Jeffrey Rosen, the C.C. Bell Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. He is the winner of the Brinker Award for Scientific Distinction for Basic Science. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Congratulations on your award. Your lecture is Targeting of Breast Cancer Tumor Initiating Cells. Would you begin by describing the explanations for the observation that many patients relapse after a favorable response to chemo and radiation? So we felt that there was a subpopulation of cells within tumors and that this subpopulation of cells, which has been defined either as cancer stem cells and we like to call them tumor initiating cells, were more resistant to conventional therapy, uh, radiation chemotherapy. And uh, when we uh, actually had patients come in in uh, the Bentaub County Hospital that uh, had very large primary tumors uh, of almost nine centimeters in size because of the fact that there's a large underserved uh, population in the city of Houston, about a million and a half people have no health insurance. And we, had, we were uh, forced to, prior to doing surgery to actually do neoadjuvant chemotherapy to shrink these tumors. This allowed Jenny Chang, my clinical colleague, to uh, do vacuum-assisted biopsies both before and after treatment and to test the hypothesis that there was a population of cells then that uh, were resistant to treatment, they were intrinsically resistant. This is not a, there's two types of resistance. There's an intrinsic resistance where you can acquire resistance after treatment, but this is initial intrinsic resistance. So um, she did biopsies before and after, and uh, she fact sorted using markers that had been initially described to uh, identify uh, these cancer stem cells, and she was able to show that, uh, in fact, that this, although the tumor shrunk, that this population of cells actually increased. Um, at the same time, we grew some of these in an in vitro culture system called mammosphere cultures, and again, showed that the, there was more mammospheres after treatment than before. So this was sort of the initial observation in the clinic, but that there's lots of uh, uh, confirmatory uh, observations in preclinical models also that uh, suggest that uh, when you're treating a tumor that you uh, treat the bulk of the tumor, but you may not actually be uh, killing uh, this population of cells that uh, really are responsible for relapse and, and uh, recurrence of, of the cancers. So you examined these two possibilities and you then confirmed the results by studying paired human breast cancer core biopsies? Yeah, these are actually done, uh, uh, as I said, pre and post treatment uh, from the same patient who have these very large tumors, which it's only with the help and, and uh, assistance of these patients that we could really do these kinds of studies that we think are really important because it allows us to look at a fairly short time frame with uh, treatment, uh, what happens in response to treatment. So what are the next steps toward targeting breast cancer tumor initiating cells? So people have started to understand the pathways in these cells that are different from the bulk of the tumor cells and uh, there are several pathways that we know are important in normal stem cells that seem to be altered uh, in, uh, in these cancer stem cells. So the NOSH pathway, the WIND pathway, and several others. Uh, and so uh, there are certain uh, clinical trials, one of which was discussed at this meeting, where people have used NOSH inhibitors uh, to see if they can sensitize these cells. Uh, uh, that's, that's a very small trial that's just been done at Baylor and Michigan and, and at Harvard. Um, but we actually have done two things in my lab. In, in, mostly in preclinical models, not in, not in the clinic yet. Uh, one is um, a student in my lab discovered that a slight increase in temperature from only 37 degrees to 5 degrees to 42 would sensitize these cells um, uh, in, when they were actually treated with 6 gray of radiation. And uh, that was actually a serendipitous story where she came in one weekend, uh, someone had the temperature on the incubator had been turned up by accident and uh, her glasses fogged up and she found her cells were all dead and where they normally would not be, have been killed. And um, based on that observation, we actually uh, decided to, to look at the role of hypothermia uh, to see if we could sensitize to conventional radiation treatment. Uh, this is uh, actually the oldest probably treatment for breast cancer. It goes back in papyrus to the Egyptians. Um, where they were heating things up to try to kill them. Um, and, but the problem is most of the early hypothermia trials, which have been around for a long time, involved heating the whole person up. Uh, clearly with mice, it's a little harder because we didn't want to heat the whole mouse up. But uh, it turns out that uh, at Rice University across the street, as a, 
uh, offshoot of, of, of the buckyballs and Richard Smalley, there were people working with gold nanoshells. And these gold nanoshells, uh, uh, colleagues at MD Anderson have showed when you inject them uh, intravenously in a mouse are concentrated in tumors because tumors have leaky blood vessels or vasculature. And so uh, this was called the enhanced permeability effect. And when you then inject these, they get concentrated in the tumor, and if you have a near-infrared laser, you can selectively heat up these gold nanoparticles. And so we did this. We rapidly heated up for 20 minutes uh, while giving the radiation treatment. And we now found that not only did we shrink the tumors, but we actually removed these cells as well. And, and so that was one uh, sort of exciting result that's recently been published in Science Translational Medicine. That result is, is I think, exciting, but probably limited to primary tumors that you can access with the laser technology, because at the present time, it's, we still can't use this for metastatic disease, which is, of course, where most patients die. Um, so we think we will actually have a clinical trial of this, but maybe only in local recurrence or in potentially inflammatory breast cancer, which is a local disease. Now, in terms of targeting systemic, uh, uh, systemically, we, we really were looking for pathways that were affected, again, in these uh, tumor-initiating cells. We had done some gene profiling and found that there were actually alterations in P10 and phospho-AKT and downstream the canonical wind pathway. Um, uh, and when we saw this, we actually uh, decided to see if we treated with a, an AKT inhibitor that's an orally active drug called parafosine that was actually in clinical trials, that we actually delivered this by oral gavage to the mice uh, and then gave the radiation treatment just short term for 48 hours to the mouse, could we sensitize the cells. And it turns out those uh, experiments also were successful in our preclinical model. Uh, comparable studies were done in primary human xenografts at uh, Michigan by Max Witcher using uh, chemotherapy, not radiation, doxorubicin, plus the same AKT inhibitor. So that's a, another sort of approach now that is, is moving into the clinic to try to use these AKT inhibitors as well to see if they may sensitize these cells. So the overall approach is, is to really define what the Achilles heels are of these cells, to use targeted therapies in combination with standard of care, which is either going to be chemotherapy or radiation. We think using them as single agents by themselves may not be totally successful because there's too much plasticity in cancer and, and that we need to really target the bulk of the cells along with these subpopulations at the same time. And, and this concept, I think, now is starting to get acceptance that we have to really uh, do these kinds of combinations to really target these subpopulations of cells. Thank you so much.